doing that because that's an interesting part. Because I'm a, I'm a chiropractor, and 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 with my patients, you know, a lot of the times the the fundamental knowledge of what can we do to help ourselves feel better is not necessarily taught in a medical doctor's office or in a general society or general um, uh, a school system. And so I feel like that's really the part that serves the most of the value that I would like to put out is, 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 you know, the knowledge of how you can take better care of yourself and then give you some of the tools. To yeah. You know? I mean, that's my, my agenda. My agenda is not to be a college professor. My agenda is to just teach as many people about their bodies understanding so we can make better decisions about that as possible. That's my agenda. Are you able to uh, manage your agenda well to be able to have time for to be both a chiropractor and, and a professor to do two different classes? Well, we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see. I don't know. I mean, the pandemic threw everything out of out of out of whack, and you know, this was the first time when I wasn't full at my office and I didn't have clients all the time. It wasn't my own fault, you know. It's like, oh, that's a different perspective. Yeah. Uh, you know, so it's interesting, and 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 I think you know, I, I think it's both. I mean, one of the things is if I work when I work four, five days doing chiropractic, I was, you know, I was hurting a lot. Mm. You know, it's very physical. And, yeah. And, and doing some more education stuff, I think is very helpful. And one of my goals is to, to have a massage school at Merit, but you know, who knows if that's gonna happen because some of the techniques I do clinically are very, are very um, uh, specific. And, and, and I do, one of the techniques I do, I do with athletes like the Raider people or Stanford people. Um, and I would like to teach that more to the common broader population because I think some of the techniques can be uh, very not it's not that difficult to teach it and and so that's my bigger agenda but we'll we'll see if that ever happens especially with COVID, right <laughs> one day just the, don't don't bring your hopes down no if no you I, won't, your, I won't if you have your mindset on it one day it'll happen that's right that's right and that's why and that's why i i this this teaching this class has was a hobby at first and it's become a real passion you know so i really feel very strong about about teaching anatomy and physiology and 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 how the body works but from a perspective not to just give you knowledge so you can go to to to, to nursing school but give you as much knowledge so you can take care of your family you know that's more important to me yeah Anyway, that's a pretty good start. Thank you for being so engaging here. That's wonderful. Um, that's what I'm always waiting for, really. And so let me let me take some role. Veronice here. is here. Koa is here. Tanaya. Here. Kyla May. Here. Sarah. Here. And then, of course, Vannery, which just talked, right? Adam. Thomas here. Hello, hello, Brianna. Here. And as I'm, as I'm doing this, how is class for you going? How are the exercises? How is everything? You go, you feel all right? Or questions or frustrations? I have a question. Yes. Can you show the um? I think I have the sheet, the paper right here. So like first two exercises for the posture. I'm not sure if I'm doing the like how to retract your chin right so okay so the way i try to do it and of course you know the, the main reason i do these exercises with you so i do them myself once in a while because it's it's very difficult to remember but i take my 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 fingers and i push my chin down so i kind of stretch stretch the back of the neck a little bit okay. and then i bring the neck down as much as i can and so by doing that i assure it's like a translation movement of the neck, not a rotation movement. It's not like, oh, bring your neck back and I put my chin up. Okay. It's, that's the reason why, why that is in there, I believe. Okay. Uh, because, because there is, when I, mm. when I was, one of my patients is this football player, Bill Romanovsky, and he is really, uh, was very interesting to work with because he played 
17 and a half years of linebacker football without missing a single game. And that's, if you, if you know about football, that's like, what the heck is that about? You know? Yeah, that's like impressive. Yeah. It's the league record. And he told me, and he was known to be a knock. I had patients walk into my office go like, Oh yeah. Romanowski, he walks with a, around with a bill, with a pill case, you know, with all the stuff in it. And he taught me and, and, and he told me, two techniques on the physical front that really helped him recover so fast that he could always keep playing. And one of the technique was actually called Eldoa, which is a French acronym for an active stretching technique. And so um, he, he has two, take, two, two exercises he really does with that. And one is he lays on the back and he raises the neck up a little bit and he just elongates the top of the head and has the head up like an inch off the, t- off the bench or so. And that's a very similar exercise to bringing an egg back and, and sort of translating it backwards instead of rotating it back. Because ah. you stimulate these front muscles that are often weakened. And if you have a whiplash, which, you know, a car accident and, and, you're, and you're slamming forward and your neck goes back, these muscles get overstretched and they get mm-hmm. hurt. And so strengthening those and engaging those is very helpful. And... And, and looking at the computer, it's also because, you know, you're looking forward, you go like, what's this about? You know, and you're looking forward, you can become a chicken neck a little bit. And so bringing the neck back and retracting it, uh, generally speaking, is a very good exercise. To do. Okay. Thank you. I know. Sorry. I'm a little chatty here, but I want, no. you know, well, uh, well, at least, you know, this is one of the places where I can interject and say my... You know, when I give you these health kit exercises, they are as thoughtful as I can have them. So I, I you know, right. I try to, for years try to figure out what's, because when you get to the injury prevention exercises, that one is, hey, is actually on? very, you very. Uh, oh, hey, are you still in your class? Yeah. I'm going to run. There you go. That one is very um, uh, orthopedically oriented. So you have in, in, in Switzerland, like uh, the, the clinic that um, checks the Olympic special, the Olympians and, and works with them, they do those exercises on them to see if they're, they're physically needing to f- focus their, their exercises on certain things. And so um, <clears throat> that's why I brought them in. And that's why I feel okay bringing them in. And it's not just like goofy stuff, you know. Um, from yeah, that. I like the stretches. I do um, like the, the back three. I already do them as part of my like neck and shoulder stretching routine. But oh, I was good. like- these two feel like if I do them wrong, I could get, I could hurt my neck. So I wanted to make sure I was doing them right before I just like pushed my neck in funny ways. Well, and that's right, right. And that's why I like the, 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 the holding the chin in and then bringing the neck back as a sort of a two-step way to put your neck in the right position. That seemed like it really, yeah. it, it, it takes away a little bit of the ambiguity. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, you're welcome. And and if you go to the injury prevention, there is actually an exercise there that sort of talks about that lifting uh, neck the way I talked about, because it's very important from a perspective of neck health um, and of, 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 you know, protection of the spine and the spinal cord that, that those muscles in the front are really strong. The deep muscles in the front are really strong, not these like superficial muscles. Those are, those are more, the superficial muscles, if you want to go anatomy, superficial muscles like the, you know, the SEM, like, I don't know if you can see it sticking out right here, that muscle, that moves the neck around. The deeper muscles that are beyond a few of the layers of the superficial, they protect the, the area that they're working on because obviously an, a muscle deeper can't move things around that big. That will, uh, you know, that will disrupt the muscles on the outside. So the deeper muscles generally are, are postural protective muscles and, and that way, and the, and the superficial muscles are more moving muscles. I don't know if that makes, does that make sense a little bit? Yeah. Okay, it's just biomechanically, it would be just kind of weird, you know, it wouldn't work out that way. All right, good. Let's see any other uh, questions or points to bring up because these are very good questions tonight. I'll keep that up, please. I've got a homework question, Professor. Yes, sir. Just like a scheduling question, really. I just want to confirm that we we do actually have three modules due this week, uh, 9, 10, and 11. Or yes, that, we do. Uh, yes, we do. And, and the reason why is I wanted to, um, well, one of the modules don't have, doesn't have a, a labeling exercise with it, the physiology model. 
Um, right. And then and then I wanted to make sure we have just one week for the lower extremities. So there's a little bit of integration time. And and if you you know if you're a little slower, that's just totally fine. Okay, I think I can get it done. I just wanted to make sure. Yeah, yeah. No, no. It is three week, three models, and it um, um, and that's why I made it. So next week and we the uh, kind of focus on the yeah, test. the home office uh, ergonomics thing as well, right? Yes, and again, you know, some of those dates, if you completely get out of whack, some of those dates are flexible. You know, if you okay. if you need to hand it in a week later, especially especially the health kit stuff. I mean, I, I, I put it together so, so it should go in sequence with what we're working on. So it kind of makes some sense. But, you know, okay. just I, I, I'm fairly flexible. Um, of course, if you're, you know, if students end up flocking and I have to run after everybody, then I'm worried. But I do not punish you for late. Mm. I generally keep all the modules open until the test is finished. And then I close those modules. Um, but I'm also considering, you know, keeping some of the health kit modules open because, you know, life gets busy. Yeah, I like the posture one a lot, actually. That um, I've had posture problems forever, and I've been working on it on my own this past month. But those exercises that you have when we're sitting down, I've never actually done those. Those, uh, those will be helpful. Well, yeah, yeah. The, the, one with the, the, the one in there is, is actually one that I also, when I came across, it was like, oh, that kind of makes sense. The other thing with posture tones is, is what I told my patients for a long time before I came across that is whenever you get up to go to the bathroom or something is feel into like take a deep breath and feel into like somebody pulling up, pulling you up on your or your head and, and you're just standing as straight as you can for a hot second. And that helped, yeah, me, I do that, like, that helped me a lot. I try to like in a, in a doorway kind of like lean forward and put my arms on the side of the door and then lean into it a little bit. But being able to do it when you're seated is also good too. I think you can just do it, you know, without having to move. You can just straighten your back out. Push your yeah, and and a, and a lot of it is, you know, it's it's this constant battle because we get into our head and then forget the posture. It's just whatever we are used to, kind of thing. But you know, yeah. generally, it's really it's really about it's about this shoulder forward and the head then forward. And if we bring open up the shoulder, that's I think really the biggest component of 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 it to 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 have some good posture. Yeah, that was me just leaning forward my whole life. So I'm very used to that. I have to un undo that. Mm -hmm. a while. I know I, I was, I, you know, my posture is horrible. And then I became a chiropractor. So I, I teach people about posture. I'm like, oh my God. Yeah, so you I can't have bad whatever I can't do. <laughs> no one would trust you. No, I know, right? <laughs> and when people say, oh, you have good posture. I'm like, I'm really proud of myself because it's not easy at all. To do not that. easy, no. No, so you know those exercises. The reason why I make you do it for one week, three times, is to or something. I think I changed it now that you just really push you through for one week. Yeah. Is that we have sli a slight amount of patterning going on, and, and and we have enough time so we feel like maybe it's doing something. Yeah. I know. All right. Yeah, that's good. That's cool. They keep coming. All right. Anybody else a question? No. Yes. No. Well. Whenever it comes up, you just tell me and speak up. And in the meantime, I will go through my stuff. Um, I do want to make sure you guys know a few things. Oh, shoot, I didn't. I was printing all these things. So let's see, where is my whiteboard? I want to make sure you guys know where the videos are for the test. So let me find that real quick and give you that. Oh, before that, actually, since my page is up there, let me share this with you. I had this link. Do you see my canvas? Yeah. Yes. I had this link under on the modules. I think it's in the first module. Link to anatomy atlases or anatomy books, it should say actually. Link to anatomy atlases. So I had a link up and that link actually died for some reason. So because probably was, you know, stuff that shouldn't go out or something, not copyrighted. But I was able to get some copies, some PDF on it. So if you want on your device some good anatomy atlases, if you're interested in this kind of stuff, like, you know, I'm a nerd, so who knows? then they are all in here. So if you click on this Frank Netter thing, 
it will go to give you a full atlas online, obviously. I mean, you could print it out, but who wants to do that? Of, oh, where is it, Nether? Give me Nether, give me Nether. Uh, it went somewhere else. Hold on, I have to download it real quick. But it gives you a whole, a whole book of this, a whole 750 page anatomy book that I actually ended up putting on, on, on Dropbox. So it's, it's available for you guys to just pull it down onto your device. And of course, there's a bunch of intro. You can see it. Can you see it? Yeah. Yes. Yes. And so after all that, whatever stuff, I wanted to give you some pictures. Come on, give me some pictures. No, that's not, that's boring, but, but look at all this stuff. There's all this description and all this detail. And then it has this gross anatomy. That's really what's important because this is the book that the medical doctor has in his office, essentially. Come on. So you see all this, look at this. So a lot of the pictures that actually come out of what I work on are originally made from this guy. And so with this download, you have all the descriptions of all the little points of all the foramen and we cover a, a part of it. We don't cover all of them, but this way, you have a reference. And so I highly suggest while you have access, if you're interested in this stuff, while you have access to Canvas to um, download that. Uh, especially, I think the netter is very important. And then the other one that's also, I think helpful is, oh, my shoe boo boo boo. So no, wait, that's, that's my class, that's the class I'm taking. Who cares about that? Um, the Gilroy Atlas is also very interesting. So I want you to look at that as well. I really like the way that the Gilroy Atlas works on muscles. So let me briefly show you that. And let me know if you can see. We can see it. Can you see the muscle? On, can you see the trapezius? Yes. Yeah. So look at, look at this. So this is the trapezius. And look at, oh, actually, this is better because it's right here. This is the levator scapula, which we haven't, did we touch on that? Is that on your list? I'm not sure. Uh, but the rhomboid, I'm sure, is on your list. And see, see it's here. It's not see on the, the list, yeah. Okay. Yeah, levator scapula is one of those deeper muscles that actually clinically I work it all the time because people who have neck pain up here or then shoulder pain here, that muscle seems to be tight all the time. But look at, look at, the, the, look at the way that it's depicted on this picture. Like you see the origin and you see the, or actually you see the, the origin here and you see the insertion and then it's just a sliver of muscle. So you can really make out what is the muscle because muscle, skeletal muscles attached to bones. And it's, it's much easier, especially if you go through deeper layers of the extremity muscles to see it like that well depicted. And so that's why I like that Atlas a lot. Of course, maybe that's because clinically I work with muscle attachments a lot. But that's one of the reasons why I like that. And then the other one that I do also like is also up there. And that's the raw new Kochi. And I'm not sure if I mentioned that. You see, no, oh, I shouldn't show that. You see this brain? Yes, we see it. Good. So that atlas is really cool too, because it shows structures on a cadaver. And then it has numbers. And then on the side, it has a, a legend of what it means. And so that's also available. That's the Rohan Yukochi. So let me go to the thing again real quick. Um, you can tell I was really proud of myself, huh, to put that up. <laughs> I know, it's like all of a sudden I clicked on the link and it was gone. I'm like, oh my God. And so I went to my download and I found these PDFs that I already downloaded. So I put those up on my um, Dropbox. And so the Cadaver Atlas is really cool. That's the last one I showed you, it's the Rohan Yukochi. That's the one I use most for my studies in chiropractic school. And then the other one was the muscles. That's the Gilroy. And the first one is the Netter. Anywho, and if you go to bio two class, this is Martini. That's a textbook for Martini. So you might get lucky with that as well. Okay. If you have to do that class. Good. So that's that. And then the other thing I wanted to show you is the videos. I did that already, but basically, because, you know, right now we're working on test two, right? So we're working on anatomy terms. And I put down on module 13, there you go. 
under test review and videos, I put these review videos. And so they kind of go in line with what we're working on in terms of the skull, facial muscles, and then the uh, axial skeleton and so forth. And so a, a lot of students, what they do is to study, they just watch those videos over and over and maybe have a, a term list ready because for the test, all you need to do is label what I'm pointing at. And you don't have to give me an action. You don't have to give me a muscle insertion or origin. That's homework and that's important information, but it's also a lot of information. And so, you know, I think, uh, you know, in, in this kind of format, we did plenty was just labeling. And so that's another way of doing it where you just look at the videos and watch the videos uh, and do it with the term list. And most of those terms are the same, a couple change because it's been a while since I made those videos. Yeah, if you want to ever, if you ever want to notice your aging process, you just make videos of yourself and put it online and then you look at it through teaching and it just, you know, it's very funny. Um, okay, but with that said, if there's no other question, I'm going straight to basically covering, what are we doing today? I think we have the appendicular skeletal terms. And so let me see. And if you do have questions, just speak up. So let's see here. Can you see my shoulder? Yes. Yes. So I'm basically going to go through the terms, but I'm also going to try to give you a little bit of context um, and, and talk about <clears throat> a little bit of the structures. Um, uh, when I look, here's the shoulder girdle. So what we have here is we have, we have the, the humerus, that's the upper arm bone. We have the scapula, that's that thing here. That's um, a weird flat bone that's sort of on the back side. And then we have the ribs, we already worked on those. And then we also have the clavicle. And the clavicle is actually not a term on your list, um, but it's right here. The shoulder is, is interesting to me because the shoulder is very flexible, but it is kind of vulnerable. So if you, I don't know if you know this, if you, if you, if you fall down on an outstretched arm, you can get shoulder, you know, and, and there's a disruptive force coming in. You can get a bunch of pain in this whole area much, too, much faster than if you just jump down a little, you know, if you would jump the same distance with your legs, the legs are much more stable. And some of the reasons is, yeah, the shoulders are much more flexible. And so it's really great. And, and the shoulder, actually, if you, if you consider how flexible it is to how strong it is, it's an incredible marvel of, of engineering. Um, um, but joint-wise, since we're talking about bones, joint-wise, the only attachment that the shoulder has to the axial trunk sort of skeleton is, is right here with the clavicle. And the clavicle sort of pushes the shoulder blade back a little bit. So we're actually not in this forward bent position as much as we would be since we talk about posture. Um, and, and then the rest, the rest of the shoulder girdle attachment to the trunk is all done through muscles. And so you, you look at the, the flexibility of this machine is incredible. You can bring that arm out and go all the way across. You couldn't do that with a leg. You know, if you think about it, you got to if you compare it. Um, and what's that, what I like about this picture actually is you see how it goes up, it goes down, and medial. But then when it goes out and and a little bit in too, you do see how much the the arm works and how much the shoulder blade works. So you kind of see how those work together as a sort of a two jointed joint in some ways to create that a large amount of movement. And I, I find that very interesting. And 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 again, I'm I'm talking about it from a sort of kind of clinical perspective um, uh, because that's my approach um, because I work I work with patients on the during the day um, and so when I when I look at patients um, I, I look at their their structure I look at the joint I look at which joints are fixated or which joint which bones are not quite in the full right position uh, but then I also look at muscles and when I look at muscles I look at the muscles that in the, in the shoulder girdle, I look at the muscles that attach the shoulder, the, 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 the scapula, the shoulder, the shoulder blade to the axial skeletal. Like you see here, this muscle here, or these coming around here do that. And then I, I look at muscles that um, attach the humerus into the shoulder blade. 
And a lot of those are these here, the rotator cuffs we call them. They're attached to the shoulder blade and then to the bone, the humerus bone. Um, and then the, the next set of muscles, of course, that I look at is who moves the arm around. And then we get these bigger, more superficial muscles that move the arm around. And we'll do that more next week when we talk. I think next week we'll talk about that. But I wanted to give you the context because when I see a patient, I'm like, they come to me and go like, I got this pain. And I'm like, I have no idea. I'm like, I don't have an idea. Let's talk about how did it happen? And I figure out, you know, what are the mechanism of impact that make this position, this, this, this bone in being trouble or this muscle being trouble. And then I look at the joints and then I go and look at these different muscles, but I look at it in groups who attaches the shoulder blade to the joint, to the, to the trunk, who attaches the arm to the shoulder blade and who moves the arm around. So, um, and that's been quite successful doing that um, approach because you, you end up a lot of times in musculoskeletal medicine, we miss a lot of things. We just go down a path where we think what it is and it might not be that thing. So anyway, scapula is the shoulder blade. We, we look at the back, back of the scapula. We have a spine of the scapula and you can actually feel that on yourself if you, if you take your arm and you reach behind and you feel that ridge, that's the spine of the scapula, that ridge. And above the ridge, you feel muscle. And actually, if you massage yourself, you know, a little self-nurture, it might be very positive. And, and that's, there's an indentation. That's a muscle. That's a very important muscle that sits up there. And if you go below the spine of the scapula, you also have a muscle that sits down here. That's also very um, crucial in holding the arm in. And, and um, let's go back to these and those muscles names are actually the same as the bony parts the landmarks of the bone so the supraspinous fossa is a fossa is an indentation a sort of a, a shallowness that the muscle can sit in uh, so the supraspinous fossa supra means above so supraspinous is above the spine of the scapula infra spinous infra means below so that's below the spine of the scapula and what's good to learn is because look at this, we have muscles. One of the muscles is, oh, it says fossil. One of the muscles that sits up here is called the supraspinatus. And one of the muscles that sits here is called the infraspinatus. So it's good to learn those bony landmarks because when you do the muscles, it's damn easy to do the muscles for that. It's right there. And then this here is the anterior view. So this is a, 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 the scapula going towards the rib cage. And right there on that front, we actually have a lot of muscle attachment too in here. And then especially on the corner, on the boundary here, the vertebral border. And that's known as the suprascapular, subscapular fossa, sorry. Subscapular fossa. And the muscle that will attach to there is known as the subscapularis muscle. So again, you already learn the muscle if you learn the fossa. Back to the back. If you follow the, the spine of the scapula to the tip, that elongate or that, 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 that piece that gets bigger here is actually the tip of your shoulder. And that's known as the acromion. So when you look at your shoulder, you, you go and follow the, follow the spine out and you go to the tip. And then the tip here, what you can grab, that's the, that's the acromion. And right when you fall down underneath is, and if you're a massage therapist or anything, you know, follow these things because underneath right here, that's the humerus. So you see the acromion is up here and the humerus starts right in here. And you can sort of see if the humerus is a little to the front or a little bit to the back. Usually it's a little bit to the front. It's not aligned fully. And it, I mean, I don't think it will be aligned fully, but we want to work towards that. If it's really forward, that could mean, and you have problems, that could mean it becomes a, a pain syndrome or so. But if you don't have problems with it, then don't worry about it. That's just how you're made. And so that's, that's the acromion. And then another term that we see is as you are in the front, here's the acromion and you go medially and you have another bump right in here. And that's known as the coracoid process. That's also on the list somewhere. Coracoid process. Yes, it is under the acromion. And, and this is one of those terms where I'm like, how the hell are you going to remember that? And so uh, in class, what I came up with is on the skeleton, I just have my hand on top. And it's like, yeah, there is a little raven sitting on top of the shoulder and says on the, on the witch and says, coracoid, coracoid. And so that how, that's how people then seem to remember it, or at least the students I had in class. 
um but you know make up the the, the foolish the, the the best way to remember these terms sometimes is making up some weird goofy shit and that you know works out so when i look at the scapula so there's a front here was the acromion and then that point here is in the front that's the coracoid process and then the the only thing that we got left is the glenoid cavity and the glenoid cavity is what makes the joint if this picture is good because you see it from the side come on a little bit a little bit bigger you see from the from the side you see the, sh the shoulder blade from the side so you see the the, the, the acromion you see the coracoid process and here you see the glenoid cavity and so the humerus sits in that glenoid cavity now look at how shallow this is and compare it to how deep this looks this is the hip so the shoulder and the hip are very close together the way they're made but the, the hip is solid, has to transfer the weight down to the hip, to the feet, the, the legs and the feet. And the, the shoulder blade needs to be more flexible, more um, um, moving things around. And so, and so that's where you get that flex. You, you can, that's one of the places where you can see that flexibility that can get created uh, with having a shallow joint like that. And then around it, there's still a cuff of joint, but it's cartilage. And, 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 and so that's much more flexible. And so it, it gives, it has some give. As a matter of fact, if you look at the injuries, the slap tear is, um, is, is that cartilage piece here that can create, that can create, that can break and, and it can really cause a lot of pain and, and trouble. And so that's a labrum tear, the, the cartilage piece that is around the glenoid cavity is known as the labrum uh, and, and if that's breaking, it's a labral tear. And if a cartilage breaks or, or degenerates, it's, it's really hard to heal because cartilage doesn't have any blood supply. Because if you have blood supply and you have movement, that's not a good combination. The blood vessels will break. And so cartilage, things like cartilage don't have much blood supply. Things like bone have much more blood supply. Um, it's much uh, because they're stable. So they can have a hole go in and that hole won't be compressed. What, what happens when you dislocate your shoulder? Um, <clears throat> when you dislocate your shoulder, maybe this is better. This piece here falls down. But so like the, like the muscles are still attached to, and the like- Yeah, the yeah, the muscles are cartilage. still attached. But for example, one of the things, let me go to the humerus real quick but, um, uh, and start working on that. Because when you look at the humerus, the arm bone, you got this, the, you got the head of the humerus on top, right? That's the round structure that makes a joint. Usually a round structure like that makes a joint because you can visualize how it moves around, right? And then, and then there is on, on the humerus, there's this, finishing of that round structure and they call that edge the anatomical neck because generally after a head there is a neck and so that 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 terminology comes from there which is kind of helpful actually um and then we have these bumps we have a bump on the side of the uh humerus on top by the shoulder and a bump on the front and these are known as the tubercles, the greater and lesser tubercle and in between that tubercle we have an intertubercular sulcus or they call that groove. When I first came to America and I didn't know English at all, I was in massage school and they did anatomy with me and they was like 30 students and this lady said, oh, this is the inner tubercular groove. And I stuck on my hand and was like, groove, isn't that music? And so it's not just music I learned since then, it's also an indentation. So if you read groove and sulcus, same difference. But what I want to point to is the fact that this muscle here, the biceps brachii, tendon goes through that groove and then attaches to the shoulder blade and if you dislocate your arm it can be that this flips over so this gets out of the groove so that could happen uh sometimes and so the muscle is still attached to it but its pathway might be a little bit altered does that make sense tonight yeah and so we have to figure out then if that happens you know i i, I remember this patient she called me hysterical and she had to go to work. And I'm like, don't go to work. Go to the emergency room if that's your symptom. Because you're not going to last too long with stocking shelves or anything. Um, because I feel like they always just pop it back in place in like sports games and movies and stuff. Oh, yeah. Slam the shoulder against the wall kind of thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know. I know. I know. I, I would... I would uh, 
I, I rather have the orthopedic work on that. But if I will have to approach it, I mean, you want to bring, figure out how do you bring that humerus back in. And so there's multiple ways of doing that. Um, but it's certainly not easy and, and somewhat painful. It's kind of like if people have, you know, most of us have some twisted ankle problems. It's kind of like that for the shoulder that people get if, if it's, you know, if some people have it. Do you have that problem? No. I have right. the ankle problem, but not the shoulder problem. Yeah, we'll, we'll keep it that way. <laughs> don't, don't get the shoulder. The ankle problem is most of us. Um, but this way, I've already talked about a few points on the shoulder, on the, on the humerus now. Um, and it had a humerus, anatomical neck, and then the, the greater tubercle on the more outside laterally and the lesser tubercle more, more frontal in the front, uh, anteriorly. We don't have the inner tubercular sulcus as a term, so don't worry about that. On this view, though, and this is an anterior view, yep, what we have here is the deltoid tuberosity. That's, that's on the list. And if I go to the muscles here real quick, and we'll talk about that muscle later, of course, in more detail, but here, see this muscle that's, I call it sort of the shoulder pocket muscle, you know, because it's really what, covers over the shoulder and that's known as the deltoid and the place where it goes into the bone and the humerus on the outside the insertion is known as the deltoid tuberosity so that's right here it's a roughage on the bone you you know it, it might be somewhat hard to make out depending on uh, what bones you have uh, but that's the one I want you to know there and if I go distally towards the elbow what I want you to know uh, on that is, is, is the epicondyles and the electron fossa. So when I go to epicondyles, let me talk about the knee real quick or the femur because a condyle, see this word condyle here? Yeah? Yes. Good. A condyle is a, is a, is a, is a part of a bone that makes a joint. And so when you see the word condyle, you think joint. And then an epicondyle is a piece of bone above the condyle. So condyle will be here, the epicondyle will be here. Um, now in the humerus, the thing is they, they renamed these things that in the femur is called condyles and they call them capitulum and trochlear because the way they look, one is like a round thing, uh, capit means head, capit is head and trochlear means pulley. That looks like a pulley. I'm not so sure about that, but it does seem to indicate that they say. Um, and so these are the so-called condyles, if we just want to technically term them, but they gave them extra names. But still, above them, we have the epicondyles. So you got a medial epicondyle on the inside, uh, the medial side, and a lateral epicondyle on the outside, the lateral side. And those become very important because when you look at the muscles, all the muscles, well, not, no, no, no. All, not all the muscles, but the muscles we mainly study. So the more superficial muscles of the forearm, the forearm is very strong because you have to be able to hold and cross those hands and hold grocery bags in them and, and, and carry them. So there's a lot of muscles in here. And the, most, the superficial muscles that we talk about mostly are generally attached to the medial epicondyle and reach over to the front of the palm. And the other ones on the back of the palm that extend the fingers and the wrist that bring it up, which is not, they don't need to be that strong because you don't carry groceries this way, you carry them the other way. Um, so they're not that strong, but they're all attached on the lateral epicondyle out here and they reach forward that way. And so that's one reason why I make you study those epicondyle terms to become very, very important muscle attachments when we get to the bones. And lastly, and again, speak up if you have questions, don't hesitate. Lastly, on this poster review, this is called the electronon fossa. And fossa is an indentation. And this is the indentation where the, uh, when we go to the forearm bones, this one here, if you look at this bone, see how it's curved back here. And this piece here is what fits right into here, into the electronon, no wait, that's the front here, right here, through this part into the electron on fossa. And this is the reason why you cannot extend your elbow past 180 degrees, at least more or less. Um, you don't want to push it further back because guess what? You would have to break this bone to be able to move it backwards. 
Um, and so we don't want to do that. So the, 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 the bone that that's on is known as the ulna. See here, the ulna, ulna bone right here. And that's pretty thick in the back, in the top, as we've seen. And then in, this, in the wrist end, right here, distally, it gets skinny. And it has this little thing sticking out. It's kind of like, it's like a pen thing. It's known as the styloid process. So we have one on the ulna, the ulnar styloid process. And then the other bone that we have in there is the radius, the radius. And the radius on the, is skinny on top and fatter on the bottom. And on the bottom where it's a bit thicker, it also has that styloid process to it. You can't see it that easily, but it's known as the ra radial styloid process. And the importance for that is when you look at the wrist, here's a wrist, it's upside down, right? But so this would be the ulna, this would be the radius. You see how with the styloid process and the joint surface, it kind of makes a, makes a, makes a rounding here. And then that rounding lets us have um, the wrist bones, the carpal bones attached to it and we have a, a, a proximal row of carpal bones and a distal row of carpal bones before we get into the hand. I'm not going to worry about have you study all those terms but I want you to kind of know we have a proximal row and the distal row so if you go further in anatomy it's easier to fit in all these different words but it's a lot of terms. Um, I think they went to town with these you know and then this was much better terminology wise because all of these are known as metacarpals. So we have the carpals and then we have the metacarpals and the metacarpals are just named one through five. One is the thumb and five is the pinky. Um, and from there, since we're at here, we might as well finish that. We have the phalanges and that's your fingers. So this here is not your finger. This is the palm of your hand or the web of your hand. The fingers come out here and we have three phalanges three little finger bones because in most of the fingers because you see you can bend them here and you can bend them here so that makes this is a bone this is a bone and this is a bone so those are the three bones the thumb you can only bend in one place and so you only have two of those in the thumb and so it's kind of interesting because the thumb is kind of the big thing but the pinky has more bones than the thumb does and so the phalanges and the fingers are known as the proximal middle and distal phalanges and the thumb is just known as the proximal and the distal. Good. All right. Back up to here. When we get to the radius, we have a couple of terms on the radius too. We have the radial head, a radial tuberosity, and the neck of the radius, and the styloid. We already did the styloid process. That's down here. But the the the, the radius is not interesting. The radius is round on top, so that's like a head again. So they call it a head. And then it gets skinnier. Guess what? They call that a neck. And then it has a bump. And a bump is very often known as a tubercle or a tuberosity or a process too. But those are good terms for bumps and tubercle and tuberosity particularly. And so here, this is called the radial tuberosity. So if you see a textbook and it says radial tubercle, go with it. It's the same thing. It's just that the tuberosity is supposed to be a really big bump and the tubercle a small bump. So in some ways, this seems to be somewhat of a misnomer especially compared to when we look at the greater tubercle, which is supposed to be a smaller bump up here. But, you know, that's the ambiguity of anatomy a little bit. So just go with the flow on that as much as you can. Um, so that's that. And then from there, we go on into the pelvis. Any questions so far? No. Good. Oh, the only other thing was the, the reason why we have an anatomical position is because if you're palm is forward and in anatomical position, your ulna and your radius are parallel. If you go palm down or pronate, which that term is called pronation, we didn't really talk in class about that, but you guys still watch some video about that, right? Pronation, yeah. supination stuff? Yeah. Okay, good. We can always talk more about it, so make sure you bring it up if it's not clear. But pronation is a palm down, supination is palm up, and it's kind of like you hold a bowl of your soup in your hand. That's how I remembered supination being palm up. Uh, but in supination or palm forward, the, 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 the forearm bones are parallel. If you pronate, they cross over. And so it becomes harder to explain things uh, related to it. And so that's one of the main reasons for anatomical position, I think. Good. Pelvis. Oh, look at that. I'm getting a text. I know. I don't know how to turn that thing off. Um, when we get to the pelvis, um, we have 
How do I talk about it? So the pelvis kind of the spine brings down the force and it translates it over to the hip. That's the pelvis. And then from there, the force goes into the legs and then we walk and we're going to the feet into the ground. So the force going down that gravity force goes through the pelvis. Um, and this is actually a, a pretty important, clinically, it's a very important place uh, because if we have one pelvis is a little riding up a little bit, it puts a lot of stress on these joints. And that can create a lot of problems. Plus, if a pelvis is not quite aligned, it can put stress on the spine as well because it drives laterally and gravity going down um, puts extra pressure on some of these structures. Anywho, when you look at the, the pelvis, it's like three different bones that were fused together. Um, and, and the hip and the, the shoulder is similar, right? So. Uh, although that's just me thinking, my thinking, it's, you know, it's, it's almost like these two bones become the shoulder blade and then this bone here where it comes in the front together and it forms this, this connection here that might be almost like a clavicle, but of course in the hip. So it's much sturdier because it has to vary all the weight. So, so in embryology, uh, in, the embryo, in the embryological state, these bones are not fused. So they fuse as we get um, made basically so they first start as individual bones and we have that first bone on top that the, the, the bone where the baby sits on so the top bone here is the ilium then the bone where we sit on the sit bone area is the ischium or ischium and then the front bone underneath the belly where we we have a bone coming down together is the pubic bone um, so that's the pubis um, so ilium ischium pubis are the three different bones that make up the pelvic pelvis the pelvis um uh, one term oh look at that it's got its weird coloring i got to change that at some point um this is the this here right up here that's the iliac crest and um and that's um the ba the place where the baby sits on so that's a landmark that i that i um need you to know and then as we as we follow the iliac crest backwards let's go for here that's the iliac crest as we follow it backwards and we go towards the bug, we find this, this bump back here a little bit. Uh, the first bigger bump, and they know that as the posterior superior iliac spine. Um, and the term that we don't have is it, because if you have a, a if, if they need to say something is superior, then they need to have an inferior, otherwise, it doesn't need to be said. Um, and so there's going to be a smaller bump a little below, and that will be the posterior inferior iliac spine. But don't worry about that. You don't have to start that. Just so you know why there is that term. Why it's such a big word. Um, and then if you follow the iliac crest to the front, you have an anterior superior iliac spine that's in the front part. And you can feel that on you. It's pokey. You, it's, it's pokey right on the side of the belly kind of thing. And of course, we also have an inferior one, but we're not going to worry about that. The one term we worry about here is, is we worry about the greater sciatic notch. So that's an indentation of the bone underneath the inferior iliac spine that goes in and that's where the sciatic nerve goes through so that's important then the acetabulum is important because that's where the femur the thigh bone attaches to and if you look at the word leg in terminal an anatomical terminology the word leg just reverse to the lower leg if we talk about the upper leg we talk about the thigh and then we have the, in here we have the iliac fossa. So that's from the front. The indentation in the front uh, is the fossa. And that's a very important place for a muscle attachment. It's actually, as a matter of fact, the muscles that raise the leg up, one of the muscles raise the leg up, attaches here and goes down right onto the femur in here. And then it pulls the thigh up as it contracts. So we'll, we'll talk about that when we get to muscles. That's my favorite topic, muscles, as you can tell. Um, I would like the whole semesters to be on muscles. Um, and then um, another term that I need you to, to know is the ischial tuberosity. And the ischial tuberosity is actually the bone part that we sit on, or we should sit on. So that's the big plot. If you, if you go on and ease your butt cheek, you could do that on yourself. That's appropriate. You go on and ease your butt cheek and you push up, you find a bone, that's the bone you find, ischial tuberosity. 
And then the last one I wanted to know here is the pubic symphysis. And that's where the pubic bone comes together in the front. So that's right underneath the belly too, where these two bones come to, together, there is actually a joint. Um, and that's known as the pubic symphysis joint. Good, I think that's all I have for the femur. If you have no questions, we go right to the, cause I gotta move it, move it, move it. We have a quiz too. Gotta go right to the femur here. So on the femur, Again, we got a round thing on top, that's a head. We got a shallow, uh, an, an error thing on the bottom, that's a neck. And then we got some bumps. We got a bigger bump on the outside and you can touch that on yourself. That if you push on the outside of your thigh, you find some bone, that's the greater trochanter. And then on the inside, that's hard to find because it's really right underneath the inguinal um, thing, right where the femur, right where the thigh kind of starts. So you got to be right going in there. When I feel, find it on patients, I have to make them contract them also so I can feel for it. But that's the lesser trochanter. And so that's the little bump on the inside. So that's like the tubercles in the humerus. This is very similar there. And then another thing that I want you to study to know is the linea aspera. First of all, it's, of course, it's a really wonderful name, but the other reason why is because look at the muscles here. These muscles on here are, are attached to the, to the pubis and this ischial tuberosity, and they go right to the femur. So if you have your femur sticking out like that, your leg out, and you, and you, and you want to bring it in, you contract those muscles. And those muscles are known as the adductor muscles. They add the thigh to the body midline. I had one patient and, 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 and he, was, he was a really good athlete, Christian McCaffrey. He's at the NFL now and he did a lot of, zig he was at Stanford, he did a lot of zigzag running. And these muscles, you know, these medial stabilizers were really, really strong and really tortured on him. It was very interesting to feel that and then see an athlete actually perform. He's really, really good if you ever watch football. Um, and the other muscles that also start, that's also interesting. They start at the linea aspera in the back. Oops. And then, and then, um, uh, did I move that puppy? I don't want to move this thing. Um, and then they go around to the front and they come out and they become your quadricep muscle. So the quadricep muscle, most of them actually, or the, the two really big ones on the outside and on the inside, they start in the back of the thigh and wrap around and become massively big in the front. And so that's why this linea aspera is an important part. There's all this muscle that attaches to it. Anyway, let's go further down. We have the condyle, medial condyle, lateral condyle. We talked about condyles are joint surfaces. So the medial one is by the head of the femur. So that's medial, that's the inside. The other one's on the outside, that's lateral. And then the patella surface is just in the front of the thigh, distally, you know, the patella is the, 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 the bone that sits there, the kneecap. So you can see it right here. There's a kneecap right in here. That's the patella. And that sits in that groove in here. And so it, it, it helps the quadricep. It's actually interesting what a sesamoid bone does. I think I mentioned it in the in the in the in the in-class lecture. But but the, the reason why we have a, a bone inside this quadricep muscle is so it it it, it helps smooth the, the motion. So if you think about although here we don't have the the tendon from the quads come down. It's a little bit interesting the way that they draw it, but you know you can see it. And then the patella is here. And then the, actually the ligament continues right into here to what's known as the tibial tuberosity. And if you look at your tibial, if your tibial um, list, that's right there. Tibial tuberosity is the third term, term down, and that's an attachment. That's a bump in the front of the knee that all these quad muscles attach to. And if if you wouldn't have that patella. The muscle will go here and then straight down. And you could not contract that muscle smoothly. You would have to have a lot of contraction here before you can create any movement because the angle is almost a 90 degree angle. And what the tip, what the patella does, it sits inside that tendon and it makes it roundy. It rounds that tendon. And then a, 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 an increased muscle contraction up here will create movement down here that is smooth and continuous and not builds up up here. And then all of a sudden it overcomes that force and then it, the knee just jumps up. Did that, was that too much or did that make sense? It made sense. Oh, good. Okay. Because I, you know, as the more I can give you context, the better I feel like it, the more interesting it becomes, but 
if I'm if I'm if I'm in, in a classroom, I can sort of see if people space out, and Zoom, I can't see that. Mm -hmm. So you make sure you 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 tell me that, okay? Uh, yeah, I to... think I think it gives good context for when we're going to learn those muscles in the legs. Yeah, so... yeah, and and then the muscles are not as just brand new, fresh, you know. Yeah. Um, good, good, good. Okay. Yeah, yeah. You just stop me when it comes to this stuff. I can talk for twenty four seven. So just talk to my wife she'll tell you that so you can stop me um anywho tibia what do we need about the tibia well we got another condyle we got another area where we make joint surfaces so that's a called condyle medial lateral and then we got that bump in the front that's a tibial tuberosity we already mentioned that and then as we go distally down we get to the ankle and then we have a medial malleolus and you can consider that like the styloid process in some ways it's a similar thing it's just bigger so they call it the malleolus uh, but it also makes this rounding on that joint that then comes down on the heel and then the fibula is the outside bone the outside bone is more of a stabilizer the fibula is more as a stabilizer i want you to know the lateral malleolus out here um, but when you think of the force the force comes down really through the tibia and goes right into the ankle and pushes right into this top bone here you see that bone right there, that's that top bone, or you can see it from the side right in here. And that bone is known as the talus. And so that's where the force comes down from the leg and then it distributes it to the back and to the front. In the front, we got this nice arch, so it gets a little bouncy. So that's very helpful. So if we have flat feet, that's why I do advocate people having inserts in the shoe for arch support because that is an important shock absorption thing. Um, but the most, the bone from you guys that I want you to know about is besides the talus and here's the heel bone. That's the calcaneus heel bone. Then I'm not going to worry about knowing meta. And, and these are known as tarsals. In the wrist, they're known as carpals. And here they're known as tarsals. So then these become metatarsals, not metacarpals like the hand. But these are also phalanges. That's the same terminology. So I didn't even put it on the list. You just, we just do that on the hand and then, you know, you translate it to the bottom, to the feet. Good. Any questions to that? I'm good. Then I want you to take out a sheet of paper. And we're going to do a quiz. For the remaining 10 minutes we have. You got a sheet of paper? Yes. Take out your term list. And yeah. you got it? Good. And no, not yet. Oh, not yet. Go for it. I'm wait. Let me know. Okay, I'm ready. You ready? Good. All right. Then I want you to write down number one. And don't say it, just write it down. Number one, I want you to tell me what's the cheekbone called? I'm going to grill you until we have to test. Cheekbone is number one. Number two is the landmark. So when I do the test, I ask for bones. That's a whole bone and landmarks. And that's a part of the bone. So number two, I want you to tell me what's the landmark on the occipital bone. That's the bump on the back of the bone. The bump on the back of the head, not the back of the bone. The bump on the back of the head. So if you feel, you can feel it on your own head back there, most likely. Otherwise, you have a really smooth head. I have a Neanderthal head, so mine is very bumpy. All right, that's number two. Number three, I want you to tell me what's that indentation. If you look at the skull, this is the front. This is the back. There is the frame and magnum, and there is this little indentation there in the middle section somewhere. That's where the, where the, the, the pituitary gland sits in. Gland sits in and, and translated this area means the, cell, uh, the, the Turkish saddle. Oops. Turkish saddle, you got to know that. That's on the test, I tell you. And then, no, it better be on the test since I said it. And then um, number four, I want you to tell me this this little, it's a little hard to see here, but this bump, this, this ridge that goes from the area to the ear, kind of, the outer ear. And it's actually where the, the, the hearing apparatus is in. So it's very interesting. That's number four. Number four, yes. And then number five, and if I go too fast, let me know. I just want to make sure we move, we don't go too late. 
Number five, I want you to tell me in the front of the skull here, right above the nose really is this plate, this area. I said plate again, this area that has a lot of holes in it and the nerves from the nose go right through it and then connect with the brain to make you smell. What's that area called? Number five, that landmark number five. And number six, I'm looking at a chewing muscle on the side of the jaw. What's that muscle called? Number six. Number seven then, again, you stop me if I'm too fast. Number seven is a muscle that is attached to the outside the angle of the mouth, the corner of the mouth and goes down. What's that muscle called? One that goes down from the corner of the mouth. That's number seven. Number eight, moving right along. What is the top vertebra called? The top vertebra is a ring vertebra, a ring structure that is, got its name from Greek mythology as holding up the earth. And for us, it's of course holding up the head is the planet world for us. And then number, so that's number eight. Number nine, since we're at here, is what's this bump that comes up, this um, process that sticks out of the second vertebra on the skull. There you go, the second, that, that bump thing. God, I hate this picture. I see my fingers all the time. That bump here. That's number nine. And then number 10, I'm looking at the rib. And, and you can see the stuff that's in focus. This is bump here. Then we have this narrow structure. And then we have another bump. I want you to tell me the first big bump here as number 10. What's that? Number 10, numero 10. And then on so number 11 is number here on the breastbone. Tell me what is the lowest tip of the breastbone called? It's a very cool looking name. And just because of that, it's probably going to have to be on the test. The tip here. So that's number 11. We're going to have 16. Number 12, what's this whole bone called? What's this whole bone called is number 12. Number 12, the bone, not a landmark, the bone. The number 13 is a landmark and it's that ridge that's on the back of that bone, the ridge on the back of that bone. What's that landmark called? Number 13. And then number 14 is when you look at the forearm, let's see, I might have a better picture of that. Yeah, there you go. That's a posture view. So I look from the back. So here's the electron on process. This is the ulna. This is, what bone is this? Give me the whole bone. What bone is this? The outside. Um, yeah, it's actually in anatomical position. It's the outside forearm bone. That goes, the other thing with this bone, it goes to the thumb. You always associate this bone going to the thumb side. That becomes helpful when we do muscles as well. So that's number 14. Number 15 is on this hip bone. What's this ridge called? What's this ridge called where the baby can sit on? That's number 15. The ridge of the side of the pelvis. The ridge of the side of the pelvis, number 15. And lastly, but not leastly, and you're very good running fast with me. Um, when you look at the leg, where's a good leg? Come on, give me, give me a good leg. Yeah, that's pretty good. So you got that main leg bone and leg, again, leg means the lower leg. Uh, main leg bone and then the outside is the stabilizing bone. What's that bone called? Oh, no, no. What's the main leg bone called? Give me the name of the main leg bone. The main meaning the weight bearing happens there. Weight goes through them. The other one is important too. Don't get me wrong. Very important. Stabilizing. Otherwise, we'll flop to the outside the whole time. Good. All right. So now when we solve the quiz, 
what I want you to do is everybody, and we got not that many students, but we got 11 students. I want you all screaming into the microphone and telling me what it is. And so I want to hear all the voices because when you speak it out, you learn it. So what's number one? Zygomatic, Zygomatic bone. bone. Good, zygomatic bone. What's number two? EOP. External occipital protuberum. Very good. External occipital protuberance, or as you said, EOP is totally perfect. You can even write the EOP and do that one on the test. I have it lit in there. It's a very common, cool. common, common, um, what is it called? The common um, acronym? Abbrevi acronym, abbreviation. There you go. Uh, <laughs> getting tired mm -hmm. here. I've been doing this book and stuff since six in the morning. Uh, what's this number three called here? Cella Turcica. Cella Turcica. Everybody, Cella Turcica. It's like, you know, you must speak Italian. You can speak Italian. Italian. You know, Cella Turcica. Sounds good. Um, um, in Switzerland, we have all these different languages, so we all speak these different dialects with each other. Uh, what's this ridge called here? Is it the Petrus portion? It is the Petrus portion. That's very good, Sarah. Everybody, Petrus portion. Petrus, Petrus portion. There you go. I know it's kind of weird when you're speaking in the microphone. I have to do it the whole time. I, in the <laughs> fall, I took English class and an English writing class, and because I and and it was mostly Shakespeare, and we had to read Shakespeare on Zoom. It was so funny, and 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 the teacher had to assign people to reading because they would be too shy, and as soon as their part would come up. Oops, their internet connection broke. <laughs> it's like two or three in a row and they will disappear. The poor teacher it felt so bad. But um, it's pretty funny. So, you know, we just got to jump over the shadow. I've, um, of course, it's it's easy for me because I do it the whole time. Anyway, that was the Petrus portion. Number five. What's number five? Cribriform plate. Cribriform plate. Very good. All these holes are all the nerves that make you smell the good food you're going to eat. That's the creep reform plate. It's interesting how that, like really from the nose, it goes right up there and then it connects right to the brain. It's kind of interesting um, how, how it all is kind of real like that. Number six. Masseter. 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 Good job, guys. But that wasn't 11 people. Masseter. Hello. Masseter. There Masseter. you go. There you go. Na number <laughs> seven. <laughs> Depression anguli oris. Good job. That is very good. Depressor anguli oris. Everybody. Depressor anguli, anguli oris. See if we all speak at the same time. Nobody hears how bad we say it. It's all anonymous that way. Number eight, the round bone. Atlas. 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 Good job. And number nine. Then. Then. Good job. You guys are getting this. Number 10. The Crostal fossa? No. Rib, rib head. Rib head. Oh. Crostal fossa. Um, um, where is that? I have to look that up. That's somewhere in here. We don't, it's not on the list though, right? Make sure, yeah, make sure. I, I only ask you terms that are on the list. When you do the test and you freak out, not that you all have to freak out, but some people have a little testing. I have a little testing. Make sure you only have to worry about the terms on the list. Don't worry about all the other terms that could be in the body, okay? <laughs> okay. Well, I know if, you have, if you freak out, just shoot me a text and I'll calm you down. Because you got seven, you got a long hour, you got like four hours or so to do the test. So, you know, don't, don't worry about the, 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 the timing either. Okay. Anyway, next is the 11. Right. Typhoid, process. typhoid process very good isn't that's a nice word this is yeah we'll talk about that later number 12 scapula scapula, scapula. good number 13 we just talk about that spine scapular spine spine of the scapula scapula spine all that is perfect and then number 14 radius the radius, radius. The radius. Oops, sorry. Very good. Number 15. Iliac crest. 
Crest. Ilya Crest, very good. And number 16. Tibia. tibia. That was the tibia right here, the lower leg, the main lower leg bone. Perfect. Good. So um, excellent job. Um, the only thing else I want to make sure we talk about is, is, is I mentioned the posture thing on, on Monday, but a lot of students haven't done that yet. And so I'm going to talk about the posture, um, a posture thing um, when I went on next Monday or something like that. Um, so some integration. So what would it help for you? But I want to make sure that this week you guys look through the home office ergonomic. Um, and, and essentially what that is, is, is trying to, you know, do some checklist of, of, of your, of, if, if your home office is sort of set up ergonomically. Do you, have you looked at that, that, that exercise yet? I haven't. No. Okay. No, thank you for bringing it up. Okay. Then, then let you guys do that this week and then, and then we'll talk about that next Wednesday. Okay. Uh, that all right? That sound all right? Sounds great. Yeah. Okay, good. Then let me just make sure I got all you guys more or less on the on the on the, on the roll. Who's here? No, I, I roll's kind of your you know extra credit thing. Um, although I think it's very important to be on Zoom. It's just I can't make you guys do it for some reason. My hands are tied. While I'm doing that, any questions left for today? I, I'm curious, um, I came, like my Wi-Fi wasn't working, so I came in at like a minute late, and I'm wondering what the question was at the beginning that led to the conversation about different length classes and um, what we learned for in a six-week class versus a 10-week class. Oh, yeah, we just were chatty, and I've been doing, how, how was your day, and I've been prepping for my nine-week class. Um, it's basically the same material. It's just way heavy in terms of how fast you go. Is it like the next level anatomy physio course? No, not, uh, no. Well, it's interesting, you know, because I, I, it's very interesting. I am taking the next level at merit myself to sort of review, mm -hmm. see where my, you know, if my class, what's my class is missing versus, versus that class. And so far my class is almost deeper in many aspects, it seems, for in terms of how many muscles you need to learn and stuff like that. So I think it's a, it's very, it's, it's an, in, it's interesting and comfortable. Uh, what's different about the bio two class is like, you have to kind of read the textbook yourself, which is like, you know, a lot of fluffy language that you have to dissect and figure out, or the terminology becomes a little bit more tricky uh, because they're just applying the terms that we're learning and you're supposed to know them already. And so it's, it's, it's good to do, I think it's good to do the intro class and then do the, the, the more bigger anatomy class at merit. Um, but the level of detail, you know, it, it, I guess, I think it also depends on the instructor, what they're focusing on. So I'm, okay. you know, Thanks. I've taught, I've taught all the levels at merit uh, over the years and I've, I've enjoyed this the best. And then second, I've enjoyed the pure anatomy class the best, but maybe that's just because I like muscles and bones, you know? yeah <laughs> it's my topic well you know if you grow up with a lot of back pain as a youngster you're going to be interested in this stuff that's my pathway and so anyway any other questions good let me let me take quick roll give me a, a life sign um uh veronese here koa koa tenaya here kayla may here. Sarah. Here. Vannery. Here. Adam. Here. Thomas. I'm here. Brianna. Here. Caitlin. Here. Koa. I'm here. Oh, there you go. Good. Now I hear you. Perfect. Any last thoughts? And um, uh, any last thoughts on your end, but also uh, from questions, but also Always please uh, make sure if you have any thoughts of how to improve on the class or suggestions, let me know in class or, 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 or text me. So that way I can make the class better and better. All right? Okay. Thank Good. You. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you. Appreciate your involvement. Have All a right. good day.
Have a good night. Have a good night. Have a good night. Bye. 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 Bye.